All right, I'm gonna jump in. Um, hello again, I'm Jessica Kemp, Vice President of CPEX, and welcome to our plenary uh, featuring Dr. Anne Christine Duhame. I want first to mention some housekeeping things again. Uh, everyone should know that this session is approved for continuing legal education credits. Attorneys should have received a CLE form at check-in. Planners, landscape architects, architects, and lead professionals may also receive credit. Again, go to the continuing education table in the foyer. I want to thank our session sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, as well as all of the summit sponsors who are listed in your program. The summit would not be possible without their support. So getting into our plenary. Planning has always been a long game that requires us to contend with the challenges of engaging people and resources around a vision that may not come to fruition for years or even decades. We also know that long-term planning is crucial for driving progress towards big goals. Now we face what is arguably the most important long-term goal we've ever had to pursue, adapting to and mitigating the impacts of climate change. It seems a tragic irony that something that is literally crucial to our very survival requires changes and actions that we are struggling mightily to implement. That this is why you're about to hear from Dr. Duhame, what you're about to hear from Dr. Duhame is so important. A deeper understanding of why these changes are so difficult will help us structure everything from advocacy to public outreach and engagement to planning and implementation processes at all scales to be more effective and help us reach our climate goals more expediently as we know we must. As a bonus, on top of helping secure the survival of the human race, I think you'll find Dr. Duhame's insights into our brains and the reward mechanisms that guide our learning, behavior, and decisions are relevant to many other aspects of our lives, from our careers to our relationships, spending habits, and hobbies. It's fascinating. Dr. Anne Christine Duhame is a senior pediatric neurosurgeon at the Massachusetts General Hospital and is the Nicholas T. Zervis Distinguished Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. She is a faculty associate of the Harvard University Center for the Environment and has a longstanding interest in the relationship between the brain and behavior and in environmental issues. Her book, Minding the Climate, was awarded the Sustainability Book of the Year in 2023 by Project Syndicate. She now serves as Associate Director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for the Environment and Health and as Associate Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Climate Change and Health. After Dr. Duhame's presentation, I'll be back to welcome Melinda Deslot, who will uh, Delot, I'm so sorry, I practiced and I forgot. Melinda, Melinda Delot, who will join Dr. Duhame to continue the, uh, continue the, the discussion. Um, but for now, please help me welcome Dr. Anne Christine Duhame. Good afternoon. Don't you hate giving a talk right after lunch? If you fall asleep, I get it. I fall asleep every lecture right after lunch. Thank you. You probably wonder if you walked into the wrong conference. Why is a neurosurgeon talking to you about planning and climate change? It really makes no sense. I hope by the end of this, it will make a little more sense to you. I'm going to wander around and maybe even pick on people and be a little interactive here. Um, so there is a connection. How many of you have a relative who thinks climate change is not human made and doesn't believe in it? Yeah, everybody, right? So what I hope we will accomplish is to give you some insight as to why that is, why that, as you know, makes our challenge very frustrating. Sometimes you feel like you're beating your head against the wall um, and nobody gets it. And we've heard a lot of really excellent speakers that have described some of the challenges. So what I would like to try to do in this time we have together is give you some framing for why that's not surprising and maybe the beginning of some tools for how to help deal with it by taking how our brains were designed by evolution to work into account. So that's what we're going to spend our time together doing. So what we're going to cover, we're going to give, uh, this audience doesn't need an overview of climate change and environmental decline, but I just want to hit some high point talking points that sometimes, um, for me anyway, were, were uh, change agents. We're going to talk about the neural origins of how your brain works, for what roles did our brains, what tasks did our brains evolve based on evolutionary pressures, 
what is the role of the reward system and what does that even mean? We're going to talk about what's different about the 21st century. Besides climate change, there are so many different things um, and which behaviors matter the most for climate change. We focus on individual things. I was talking to a colleague outside when we were eating lunch about, oh, I hate these plastic utensils, but is that really where our biggest impact is? How malleable is the human brain? How much can we change? And how much does, does this information even help us? Is it even useful? Especially in your professions in planning for the future. So there should have been a warning on the last slide. You're gonna see gross things because I'm a neurosurgeon and this is how I've spent most of my career. I am not a climate expert. I've had to learn it through people who know much, much more than I do. This is my world. Um, I have now stopped operating because I found that I could not do this work and take care of individual very ill patients and take call and be there for emergencies. I couldn't do it all. And so I have transitioned my career to focus on climate change, climate change and health. Although I still am an active clinician, see patients and do consults, but I no longer am operating on humans. But these are just the kinds of things that I do and that we do in my field of pediatric neurosurgery. And it's very rewarding. It's a stressful job, yes. It's not that hard actually. People think, oh, you gotta have this manual dexterity. No, you, you just have to, there's a bunch of traits you have to have that, like, not everybody has all those traits, but you don't have to be extraordinary in any of them. The thing that's a little bit unusual is you have to be better than average in a lot of different traits that don't always go together, and that's the only thing that makes neurosurgery difficult, that and the fact that you can hurt people, and that's pretty stressful. Um, I mean, really, that's the hard part. It's not like the fancy dexterity. Uh, concert musicians are way better than neurosurgeons are at that stuff. But... Um, it's extremely rewarding. That is, when a family comes to you and says, thank you for saving my child's life, like there is no better thing. That's why we keep doing it. Like it's really, it's difficult, it's stressful, but a family thanks you or a kid thanks you or you get a birthday card or something from a patient. And like, it's really, really rewarding. And I came to realize that my connection my addiction to that reward was blinding me to what I think is a bigger problem. So in my field, pediatric neurosurgery, you help a lot of individual kids and families. And any of you who have had neurosurgical problems or have children or family members that have needed a neurosurgeon, when you need them, you need them. And, and you're grateful for them. And it's really rewarding to be able to have the privilege of doing that work. But it is not the biggest problem that we face as a species. This is the data. You saw some curves like this before. You've all seen this. This is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over many years and um, going back Hun whoops, I'm sorry, hundreds of thousands of years. And you've all seen this, it, it oscillates over normal fluctuations. This is the change just in some of our lifetimes really, um, from 1950, that's a little before my time, the current level, nothing has been like this during human existence. Nothing has been to this level uh, ever before. This is a new problem. And so just on that alone, somebody used the example on the prior panel of, you know, it's like the elephant that everybody has a little bit different perspective on. We've never dealt with a problem quite like this before. This is new to us. Below that, you see the Lancet countdown. Lancet, for those of you who don't know, is a very uh, famous medical journal. And um, more and more medical journals have made the connection between this crisis, climate change, and its causes, pollution from fossil fuel combustion and other causes, but that's the predominant one, and human health. That it's, you know, we've made tremendous gains in human health, but this problem is our biggest threat, and it's a really significant one, as was pointed out in some of the prior speakers' talks. So I found, when I started to go down this road, because I've always been concerned about the environment, even before I went into medicine, uh, and it's always been on my mind, I needed to understand, like, what's the scale? I'm a scientist by training. I do neuroscience research. I study traumatic brain injury in infants and young children, um, both in the laboratory and in my, uh, in my clinical work. And I didn't, you know, we're numbers oriented in science, as many of you are. And I didn't really understand, like, the scale and the, and the variable magnitudes. So these were the facts I needed to know. Many of you know these already. Uh, the, you know, people say, oh, it's not us, it's them. 
well, who's us and who's this, who's them? The U.S., of course, has been the biggest contributor to the total amount of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over history by far. Um, because CO2 lasts, depending on what part of the carbon cycle you're talking about, between hundreds to a thousand years or so in the atmosphere, China is now the single biggest per annum annual contributor to CO2 in the atmosphere, but we've been at it for longer. So what's up there is mostly from us as the predominant uh, contributor. Now, one of the questions is, if you talk about individual behavior, the choices we make, like what we, you know, how we get around and how we live and so on, what we consume, people say, gee, it's those little things, those are really not the problem, the problem is, industries, companies, governments, big scale institutional change that I can't as an individual change. And I kind of wondered what, what was the actual, what were the numbers? Well, it turns out that roughly you can find different equations, 20, 80%, 40, 60%, 30, 70, but if you put them all together on average, just as a working number, about half of the problem of carbon dioxide excess in the atmosphere comes from things that individual people choose in their lives, and about half comes from things that most of us can't influence in our domestic life. So. There is a lot at the individual level, it's just that there are so many of us that um, everybody would have to make a big change. And half comes from other things. Now, what about, how far do we have to go? These are rough estimates, rounding numbers, you can argue with them, those of you who are more expert than I am, but these are ones that I find useful as uh, sort of guideposts. The US per capita is roughly 20 tons of CO2 produced per person per year. It may be a little bit lower because of changes from uh, coal to natural gas over the last couple of years. The world average is about five tons per person per year. So we are here in the US on average, granted there are some people that have a very low carbon output, particularly low income people um, and indigenous people and some other folks that you can think of. But on average, we're 20 tons, but the world average is only five tons. So if you take all the people in the world, it's much lower. To keep within that 1.5 degree target, which has been a kind of a guidepost for, for everybody, although most people now think we're not going to be able to keep that, we have to get down to about two tons of carbon per person per year. That's a huge change. So I found those numbers helpful for me as I was learning more about this field, just as sort of guideposts. So that sounds like so much, like what can we do? It seems overwhelming. There's a, an entity that you may know about called climate depression, and it's this sense of hopelessness, like it's like there's nothing we can do. And as you've heard other speakers say, I'm going to try to leave you with some positive uh, um, uh, figures and uh, possibilities because uh, giving up doesn't, it's not an option. We can't do it. You've all seen these things, or many of you have, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. This happens to be the 2021 figures. There are new ones, um, but they're all pretty similar. And those uh, various curves there are, this is over time on the x-axis, and amount of carbon dioxide um, uh, on the y-axis. And these things, SSP, are shared so socioeconomic pathways. You've seen graphs like this. These are basically possibilities, depending on what choices we governments, people make. Uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere will either get worse and worse and worse, and then maybe start to come down after 2100, um, or we can make changes sooner. And some of these, these uh, possibilities probably are uh, beyond us now. But we still have a lot of choices to make in these decades that we're living in now um, to change the trajectory of those curves. Now, you've heard or seen curves like that before with COVID. COVID brought this idea to the fore among the general public about flattening the curve. We're not going to get rid of COVID, but what we do will change the peak. And it's the same with carbon dioxide. So decreasing fossil fuel and greenhouse gas consumption and waste and pollutants, leveling and redistributing population levels, we'll talk about that again in a moment, um, addressing land use and biodiversity, which a lot of you have already talked about today, and obviously adapting to climate change equitably so that things are not the rich get richer, they are protected, they have the means to escape the worst, and the poor or less advantaged get left behind. 
So why is change in this sphere so difficult? Change in general can be difficult for people, but why especially for this problem? And I was curious about that, so I did what acad people in academia do, which is I took a sabbatical. So in 2015 to 2016, I took a sabbatical from my practice. Um, I kept running my lab. My partners were good enough to cover, and I went back to school, uh, got a fellowship, and I basically delved into this, and that became the basis of the book that's out in the lobby, which um, anybody that reads the whole thing, I give you a medal, because it's, it's pretty dense. Um, it's not that dense. You just have to get through chapter two. Chapter two is the technical. After you get through chapter two, it's all easier. Uh, we can talk later. But anyway, the conclusions, I'm going to give you the conclusions at the bottom here, uh, at the bottom line, but it's a lot more fun, I think, if you kind of go through the facts. So. Basically, the conclusion my students who are pictured there and I came with is we are lacking the neural equipment to even perceive CO2 and its consequences. So when you think of it, when car a, a bus goes by, you can smell the diesel fuel, but you can't smell the carbon dioxide. When the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up, you, you have no way to sense it. Why is that? It's, it's not by accident. It's because CO2 was not a threat when our brains and our senses were being formed by evolution. It just wasn't an issue. Stepping on a Lego, that's because stepping on something sharp is bad for you. Your body figured out isn't Legos, aren't they bad to step on, <laughs> right? Jacks, remember and when we were growing up, it was Jacks, no, it's Legos now. Um, but your body needs that defense and needed it during evolutionary time. We'll talk about that a moment in a moment. You can smell ammonia, okay. You can smell flowers, okay. All of these had survival advantages and so they were designed in. You can see colors. All the things you can do are not by accident. It wasn't that Harry Potter's magic wand created us this way. We were created with the talents and sensations and neural underpinnings that we have for evolutionary reasons. So that's number one. Number two, in yellow, pro-environmental behavior just isn't very rewarding. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. And that can be a cause of a great deal of discouragement when you're toiling away in this field and you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. So we're going to address that. And then pro-environmental decisions, whether they're made by you, whether they're made in a company you work for, whether they're made in a government, an NGO, um, an industry, they are just not going to have the same formula for reward that you're used to. And they are going to, on average, feel less rewarding. And this is a problem. And so if you understand that, and you understand how to substitute the kind of rewards that you're used to, like I had to for taking care of one child at a time, and having a family tell me they were grateful, and having the kid walk out eating a cookie two days after brain surgery, that is extremely rewarding. We are designed to have that sort of thing be rewarding. We are not designed, we were not designed by evolution to have climate change work in general be very rewarding. So we're going to get into that in a little more detail. What is reward? What do I even mean by it? So when I talk about the rewards of being a neurosurgeon, you get that, you understand that, right? But I want to bring you to the concept of reward from a brain point of view. Reward is your brain's way of teaching you what it is that you need to survive. That's what it was designed for. That's how it was engineered. And we've learned about brain reward circuitry to all, through all kinds of tricks through science, biomedical science. Um, Early on, it was from, like we learned about most things about how the brain works, from people with lesions. This is the famous case of Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker who had a tamping iron go in his cheek and come out the top of his head in the 1800s, and he miraculously survived. I will say it's because he had a doctor who acted as his neurosurgeon and drained the abscess, who that was ahead of his time, but they didn't know to do that, but he figured it out. And you can see that's his actual skull with a hole in it. And he was a changed man after this. And some of those kinds of rare cases early in life, uh, early in medical history um, relative to the modern era, is what started to give scientists the idea of what is this reward system. Because he became, uh, he became less, uh, he had less good judgment. He was an industrious kind of hardworking guy beforehand, kind of a rule follower, and after he became kind of a ne'er-do-well. And interestingly, at the time that this happened, the medical field 
it didn't have the internet, you didn't have all, all the communications we had, but a lot of papers were written about this because at that time, people didn't even know if this part of your brain and this part of your brain and this part of your brain were all the same. And it was just one big gamish. They didn't understand localization of function. And so, especially for psychological functions. So Phineas Gage was a really cool example at the time where people realized that certain things about reward and judgment and decision making happened in that part of the brain. Likewise, since that time, we've got all sorts of technologies, functional MRI, deep brain stimulation that have taught scientists more and more about what it is that makes winning that race rewarding, what it is that makes play rewarding. We heard a little bit about play earlier today, and um, we now have a better uh, sense of the circuitry of that system. So our brains evolved for survival. So why does the squirrel whose brains evolved millions of years ago find, seek, and store nuts and annoy you by getting into your bird feeders? Uh, I, I live in the Northeast, so I don't know. Like, do you guys do bird feeders down here? Yeah. Okay. Do you get squirrels? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, like, that's the big thing. Keep the squirrels out of the bird feeders. The squirrels are doing their thing because it helps them to survive. That's why they do it. Their brains are designed. They're not doing it to annoy you. They're doing it because their brains are wired to do that, to survive. Like, likewise, humans, early humans, uh, or people who still live in hunter-gatherer uh, circumstances, which there are people in the world that still live that, they learned both by uh, evolutionary pressures and also by cultural learning to try to acquire and save and store and protect more and more and more because the more you did, the more you survived. But it's a conflict of interest now. So your brain didn't develop, it did not need to develop really strong brake pedals about consumption because that was not the condition of our brains when we were evolving. It wasn't like we were awash in stuff, awash in food, awash in real estate. We didn't have enough. And so your brains were developed and I say your brains because our brains haven't really changed much since humans came on the scene in terms of their basic mechanisms. We've had a lot of cultural learning in that time, um, but uh, we basically are working with very similar equipment to early humans. So I always feel bad putting this house up, this picture, because I always worry it's somebody's house in my audience. <laughs> Is this anybody's house? No. That house is excessive, I'm sorry. Nobody needs a house like that. I, I don't care if you're the governor. The governor's not here, right? Okay, and does anybody need that meal? No, not only is it like too much, it's like bad for you. So the things that our brains have designed us to want are no longer healthy for us personally, nor are they healthy for the planet that we need to protect, as so many speakers have mentioned today. So why is this so hard? Well, I want to take you on a walk. Anybody that's looked at the book or heard me talk, this is like one of the only illustrations in the book. Sorry, it's not a picture book. But uh, my students came up with this because I said, we need something that shows people the time scale here. Because humans are, we tend to think about things in our own lifetime, maybe our kids' lifetime, maybe our parents and grandparents, but we're not very good. We didn't need to evolve the ability to think really long term. We needed to evolve to think about now and maybe tomorrow at best. And so this is a vehicle that shows the history of the Earth as though you are walking across the United States. And this is done at Google Walk Earth rate, and it would take you 40 days. That's not biblical, that's actually what Google Walk says it would take to walk from San Francisco without stopping at the same pace, from San Francisco, which is representing when the Earth began, to the center of Times Square. I don't know why the kids picked the center of Times Square. I would not have picked that. I would have picked the Atlantic Ocean, but that's what they picked. And so what you see is, this is the walk, starting here, ending here. This is what brain evolution was doing at the same time. And this is when things started. So single cell organisms begin in Salt Lake City. You think single cell organisms, like I got more than that for a brain, but actually the underpinnings for how your brain works started back then in single cell organisms. A single, a bacteria can quote unquote decide whether to go towards sugar or move away from ammonia. It doesn't have a brain, how does it decide that? This is so cool. Any of you who have biology, even high school biology, you might know this. 
But the way it works is that there are chemicals that just happen to get incorporated in the surface membranes of bacteria that change shape when they encounter other things in the bacteria's environment. And when they change shape, things can go in and out of the cell because pores open because of that shape change. And it changes what the cell does. That's the basis of everything, including the basis of your brains right now that are either falling asleep or staying awake. I don't know which, doesn't matter. But that's the basic principle. It's not magic. It has scientific, biologic, biochemical, molecular biologic reasons for it. And it was back in single cell organisms that the very beginning of the underpinnings of the human reward system were formed. We got a little more complicated when we get to Iowa, which is where multicellular organisms come in. This is when we start to get into our invertebrates. And again, if you look at the book, it will lay this out for you in kind of colorful terms about how people have figured this out in things like nematodes, the little worms that are like the size of a letter on a page, and they live in the dirt, and they have a very complex reward system that says, go this way, not that way, move away, go forward, stop and eat, don't stop and eat. They have a whole behavioral system based on, I think, 102 neurons that have been cataloged one at a time. And then we get into more complex organisms like the big giant sea slug, Aplesia. They're about a foot uh, in size. They're sort of disgusting looking, I think, but they really have taught us a lot about the nervous system because you can catalog all their neurons. That's where we start to get into things like dopamine. You all have heard of dopamine, the dopamine high. Well, it started back then. Why? to help those creatures survive. Dopamine tells you what it is that you need to know to survive, and it teaches you how to learn that behavior that is associated with that survival. So what does that mean? That means it's contextual. That means if you do this in this context, that'll help you survive, but you need to learn that you can't do that in this context. You have to do something else. So that's where we get into plasticity and the ability to adapt to change, which humans are very good at up to a point. We are facing the adaptation to the most dramatic and quickest, even though it seems long-term, quickest evolutionary change that we've ever had to adapt to. And we're very good at adaptation, but we have our limits based on our biology. So we don't get to um, mammals until Scranton. We don't get to primates until um, uh, right outside New York. And we don't get to humans until you're a couple of hundred yards from the center of Times Square on this evolutionary scale. Now, you're walking, it gets blown up here. Here's the carbon that I showed you before. Here's Times Square. This is your last footprint. This is your last step of your 40-day walk. The Anthropocene, when the carbon skyrocketed, it's when your big toe hits the ground on your last step. So when you think about it, if our brain underpinnings and the way we work as organisms and decision makers and what is rewarding to us began back here and was refined over evolutionary pressure all that time, and the Anthropocene with this skyrocketing carbon just happened when our big toe hits the last step, no wonder we're not good at this. It is not surprising. So all of you who raised your hand that has a relative that is struggling with this or doesn't believe it, there's a good reason for it. We've never seen anything like this, and there are certain things that make new information easy for us. There are certain tendencies we have to absorb new information, and there are certain tendencies we have based on these evolutionary principles to try to block new information that is threatening or that doesn't come from people we know or comes from talking heads that we've never heard of or includes science we don't understand. That's not surprising. So even though it's frustrating, it's kind of the equipment that we have to work with, which is an imperfect match for this particular challenge. Not a hopeless match, but not the world's best fit. This is just some examples of the bacteria, the C. elegans, which are the nematodes that live in the dirt, and aplesia, and you can learn more about it in the book, about how did they figure this out and how does it work at a cellular level. It's really pretty cool. It's kind of a cool detective story. Mammals, like I said, in Scranton. Now, um, I told you that the nematode, the C. elegans, has 102 neurons. They've tracked every one and what its role is in the reward system and how it works and how you get feedback from the environment and how you learn. But mammals have 70 million and 200 million neurons if you're a mouse or a rat. 
Some of you are urban planners. You must deal with mice and rats to some extent, right, in your jobs. But that's because they have more options in their decision making, more decision and more learning they have to do. So they have a more complicated but very similar. It's different in magnitude more than, um, more than it is in basic function. But here's something that I want you to take away as people who are in the planning world. Your reward system was evolutionary primed to be tuned and be particularly rewarded by small, unexpected variable rewards. And we'll come back to this in, in respect to what landscapes, what kinds of things, what kind of environments do people like. So when you were a cave person or a hunter-gatherer, I like hunter-gatherer better than cave people because they didn't all live in canes, caves, if you were hungry and tired and thirsty and hot and you came on a patch of berries, that was extraordinarily rewarding. Why? Because you needed to understand that those berries could help you survive and you needed to learn the features of the landscape so that next time you were in a similar circumstance, you'd know to look for those berries. That's your reward system's job. And we're very good at that. We're very good at making those associations. We needed to be good or we wouldn't have survived. That kind of reward is the most rewarding to people. Not predictable rewards, not same rewards, unexpected, not big, small, variable rewards. And that may have to do with certain aspects of landscape that people find particularly rewarding. Now, humans, that's us. Humans start 223 yards away from the last step, two and a half minutes in your 40-day walk. But your human brain has 86 billion neurons. That's incomprehensible. Each of those neurons has about 10,000 connections. Enormous, enormously complex. This is, I had to have an artist make this drawing and we had to piece it together because there was no existing good 3D drawing of the human reward system. It's a complicated, beautifully designed, incredibly, uh, I think, miraculous system to help us make our decisions with the idea of survival in mind. So what influences our decision? Well, our brains weigh our choices second to second, and they make what we call in neuroscience a utility calculation. Mice do this, rats do this, cockroaches do this. Um, and, but in humans, how we make those decisions depends on our heredity, we'll talk about that in a moment, our experience and our current circumstances. It's mediated by, in the, reward, by the reward system, which is largely but not exclusively fueled by or um, modulated by dopamine as a neurotransmitter. It's a chemical that's released that helps to smooth certain connections to make things happen more easily. Now, people say, people use the term all the time talking about the brain, it's hardwired. We can't change it because it's hardwired. I'd like you to wipe that from your memory banks. We are predisposed. We are not hardwired. There are certain things we're hardwired in, but not our reward system. Our reward system, what we find rewarding, how we make decisions, what our priorities are, we have a lot of predispositions based on our genetic history. But we are, and I'm gonna make this point, quite flexible in what we find rewarding. Um, so we have general tendencies, but we are flexible by design. These happen to be pictures of mice, uh, certain parts of the mice brain showing how complicated these neural changes are when any event happens. Things, a million things are going on at once where in this picture fluorescence is showing the neurons that are active and it's this, it's this explosion of events. It's just beautiful and amazing and we're very lucky to be humans. So as a test case for how the reward system works, what I want you to do is think about what's fun Fun is basically your reward system saying, yeah, yeah, that, do that. So I would say, just ask yourself, what's more fun? Getting a new car, thinking about the color and the make and the style and like, you know, what's, what it's gonna look like in your driveway or thinking about the mileage? Like, what's more fun? Thinking about the mileage is not fun. Anybody of you who said it was fun is a nerd. <laughs> what's more fun? Decorating your house for Halloween. I don't know why Halloween, I must have made this slide in the fall. Now it'll be spring baskets or something. Or putting attic insulation in. <laughs> What's more fun? Is there anybody who thinks putting attic insulation is more fun? It may be more rewarding to your guilt. It may be more like you're thinking I'm gonna save money. I know you live in Louisiana, but I'm in New England, right? So I'm gonna tell you, it's no fun to put in attic insulation compared to decorating your house. Okay, you get it, you get what I'm saying. If it's fun, that's your reward system. You, you didn't make this up, that's the way you're designed. 
Now, besides something being rewarding in that way, like money and that kind of stuff, we have other rewards. We're not just about acquisition. We're not just compelled to be the squirrels storing more nuts. Luckily, we d were designed by evolution for survival reasons to have other kinds of rewards. So pro-environmental behavior also is pretty weak on some of these other ones. And one of the biggest rewards we have, and everyone in this room has this because you wouldn't be here otherwise, is the reward of agency. Agency is the psychological tendency to be happy when you accomplish something, right? We all have, everybody here has that. There's nobody that doesn't have that. But when we were hunter-gatherers, those rewards of agency were right away. If you got a hunt, if you gathered nuts and shellfish, if you made a hut, that one happens to be an indigenous hut in Ireland that was reconstructed, and you had like you and your family made this hut because you know it was getting cold out. Um, if you chipped a stone tool, and I will say if you do a good operation, you get an immediate reward. It's agency. I did something, it worked. I got better at it and, uh, you know, uh, that's like incredibly rewarding. Why would that be rewarding by evolutionary principles? Because that's how we survived, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have. Now, in the lower panel is my colleague, Jonathan Slutsman, who's an environmental engineer and a physician who, who helps direct our center. He's biking to work about, from about 10 miles away in December in Boston. Okay, what reward does he get out of that? He feels like a good person, he's a pro-environmentalist guy, but it is no fun, it's not easier, it's not nicer, it's not prettier, he almost got hit by a car three times. Like that is not, and the fact he did it, he sees no change in the environmental problem. It is imperceptible because it's such a small thing in such a big problem. So pro-environmental behavior often um, uh, suffers from an agency problem. I'm getting the, the, the boot here because I guess I always take too long. I'm going to have to go through it real quick. I'm going to need like five more minutes and we'll have to cut into the questions, okay? Because otherwise we won't get to the point. I do, you know, I can give a talk really well on time usually except when I talk about this stuff. It's a, it's a real Achilles heel. So how do we decide and learn genetics? There are actually genetic studies on conservative versus liberal traits. There's actually some genetics to that. A lot of it is uh, uh, nature, not nurture. Uh, uh, I mean, nurture, not nature, but there are certain genetic tendencies that underpin that. Our life experience and our cultural learning. There is a tendency in, um, the, there is a, 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 a neurologic tendency called gullibility, which is you believe what you're told by people that you consider authorities. The problem in the United States right now and a lot of the world is that we have different streams of who we consider authorities, so we are more polarized. But what we value can vary dramatically. This on the bottom is just a scientific study of patients, a group of patients with anorexia nervosa who actually in um, MRI scanners saw going without food is rewarding. That's about 180 degrees from a survival value as possible. And it's just an extreme example of how we can change what's rewarding. This example is in the book. It's about cats. It's about how in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, cats were revered. They were gods. They were buried with their, you know, pharaoh owners. And in Europe, in the Middle Ages, cats were tortured publicly because they thought the devil lived in cats. So it's the same animal in cultural learning, um, you believe this because your elders tell you that's absolutely diametrically different. Many of you have biophilia, this tendency to be drawn towards nature. The counteraction for that is eco-depression. But why isn't a love of nature enough to save us from this problem? It's because it simply isn't, for most people, a big enough part of their utility calculation. It's something we like, but when we were being formed as beings, we did not have the pressure of saving nature because nature was all around us. So we did not develop, just like we didn't develop carbon dioxide sensors, we did not develop, oh my God, I don't have enough nature sensors. We, we have it to some extent, but it's not enough to have everybody get on board. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this other than to say I tried a test project to get my hospital to build us a new children's hospital that was net zero and really advanced by trying to appeal to those aspects of the hospital leadership's decision making that I thought would be more important than climate change, which is being the first and being an innovator and saying you did something nobody else did, which they're big on where I work. Um, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. They had other priorities, largely financial, and, uh, and we couldn't do it. They said you could do it if I could find a big donor. So if anybody wants to do a green children's hospital, let me know. 
But there are strategies that we know of from public health and from, from health in general and from other things about difficult behavior change. I looked at addiction and the Ebola epidemic. Addiction because it's individual behavior, the Ebola epidemic because it was a cultural change. And basically these are the main principles and that we can apply to the climate crisis. So these are the basic principles of difficult behavior change. Positive works better than negative. That's why climate doomism doesn't really move us forward in most cases. Information comes from people you trust. You get an award that's immediate and tangible as opposed to what you're giving up. Social rewards, and this is a, a take home message, social rewards, having like-minded people, like you look around this audience and you find colleagues, that is extremely rewarding and will help you persist. Making a public commitment in healthcare, it's, you know, we're gonna go net zero. Many of you work for organizations that make public commitments and then you've, you know, you can't back down because you feel silly. Multiple behavior strategies at once, we won't talk about nudging and budging. So change, in the pro-environmental realm has to be more rewarding the, than the alternative. You have to convince people that they can do differently, not do without. So in the environmental world and in planning, a lot of the things that you want to do that are pro-environmental also are good for health. We've heard that from other speakers. Walkability, public transportation availability, renewable energy, these all have health benefits in the local environment as many others have pointed out. There can be financial incentives such as the current IRA, um, changing codes and regulations. There can be disincentives because of penalties. Public pressure campaigns, especially from youth, have been very successful. The concept of honeybee rewards means you get somebody to do something not because of climate change but because of some other benefit. That's what um, Ford did with the um, with the lightning. They tried to, you know, they brought it to the master monster truck things and showed that it could crush everybody else and it had nothing to do with climate change. They've had some battery uh, issues lately but uh, it was a great strategy. And then social rewards from like-minded people. If a bunch of CEOs get together and say, we're gonna do this, it's much easier than doing it on your own. Institutional leaders, professionals like yourselves, and a lot of people are influenced by their own kids. So, I'm gonna wrap up, because I'm way over time already. Hard facts about pro-environmental behavior change. It won't feel, decisions to go pro-environmental won't feel like most decisions. There's little agency, you won't get much immediate reward. You won't get much for it, mostly social rewards from like-minded people and we have to count on that. It'll take changes at every level, individual lives, roles in other spheres, um, health benefits in the, in the medical community, but it's still, despite all those challenges, one of the most important things you can do. It's hard. We can't see that far into the future, but what's rewarding can be changed. Four-month-old babies didn't used to get rewarded by swiping on a tablet, and four-month-old babies now can learn to swipe. It's the most common way that parents in my office cut, stop the kids from crying now as they hand them a screen. That's a new change. They had to learn it. It's rewarding. It's designed to be too rewarding. That's a problem. We can talk more. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna end with this. There are three curves and we have to get over the hump. The three curves are the temperature curve, the population curve, which is gonna go up from eight billion to about 10, 10.5 billion, and then come down quite precipitously. And then I won't talk about this now. I'm happy to talk to people individually. The pace of change. The pace of change has accelerated to the point where people are unmoored because things are changing so fast. Your cell phone, everything you do, it's changing so fast that we're starting to outstrip our ability to be adaptable. And then you add climate change, like our very planet is changing. It's really tricky. So our challenge is to get over the hump of both the temperature and climate change problem, the population problem, and the pace of change problem, which is a separate issue. And, and have a vision for the future using that neural equipment that we have. And that's our constraint, is that neural equipment. So brain considerations in planning, pro-environmental choices are not very rewarding, but you have to embed them in other rewards like better cost, better health, uh, better livability, more you know, beautiful. Nature is good for health and well-being. Um, small, unexpected variable rewards. So when you plan, remember that that's what people find most rewarding. And in times of stress, don't underestimate the reward of familiarity. So aesthetics, community, history, you have to preserve those things that people find familiar or they won't buy it. Um, Turns out stuff, more and more and more stuff, does not make us happy. Long-term happiness studies show that a sense of purpose and our relationships, much more than stuff, give us long-term life satisfaction. So if we can prioritize that. What is our vision for the future? We all are working on it together. I'm sorry I ran over, but thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, Dr. Duhame. We clearly should have made this session longer, um, but we are going to continue the conversation for as long as we possibly can, and I'm so pleased we've invited Melinda DeLott um, from the Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana. Um, she's also uh, very well known for her 22-year career as a journalist with the Associated Press, so please welcome Melinda on stage to continue the conversation. Sorry, Melinda, I went too long. Oh, not at all. I was fascinated. I kind of was wanting you to keep going and just skip the questions, honestly. But um, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say that. Um, I will say I did actually read the book. I'm not sure I understood chapter two, but it did make me think about my behavior a lot differently. So thank you for that. Um, was it better after chapter two in terms of readability? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I was fascinated by the cat section and also the Green Children's Hospital section. Um, so, But my background is in politics here. I was a political reporter for a long time and I still track politics. So I kind of wanted to talk about the intersection of politics and climate change. You probably live in a place where lots of people believe climate change is real. They take it as fact. That is not necessarily the case here, as you know, um, even though we're the epicenter of the climate crisis. Uh, so, but that includes people in positions of leadership. So how do you get people to change their behavior if they don't accept the underlying premise of the problem? There's an operation we can do? No, just kidding. <laughs> I have a list in my mind of who should be on that table. So my friends in climate change say that people will change when the alternative is better than the present. And so it's a combination of things getting worse and being harder to ignore and the alternatives getting cheaper and better. Um, in the healthcare sphere, there's been a huge emphasis on trying to get in front of policymakers, decision makers, politicians, the health co-benefits. So one organization I'm part of, we're not even allowed to say climate change, but we are allowed to say pollution. And so we can talk about fossil fuel combustion or pollution, like maybe you shouldn't even say fossil fuel, right? Just talk about pollution and that it's better health. And so it's what we call that honeybee reward strategy, which is, it's cheaper, it's better, it's new jobs, it's healthier, da da da, if we do this instead of that, but let's do this because it's healthier. So it's uh, the concept of positive is better than negative and substitution rather than curtailment, rather than telling people, don't, you shouldn't, you're bad if you think this, think here's an opportunity. And we heard that all day. Here's an opportunity for something, da da da, and kind of minimize the whole climate change benefit. Okay, you made me a little more optimistic. I hope everybody else is too. Um, so in the book, you wrote about the rewards associated with uh, consumerism and how much that plays a significant role in our climate troubles. Uh, Europe seems to have figured out how to combat this. They, they seem to, at least a number of countries in Western Europe seem to have an idea of how to um, lessen consumerism and they seem to put an emphasis on that. So what's different in the brain for, for them than it is for us? Is it about our societal norms? Is it about our behavior patterns? Can you talk through why the US seems to, to be further behind than Western Europe on that? Yeah, this is not because our brains are different in terms of our brain equipment, but it is that our brains are different in terms of our culture and what we learn. And so the book goes through the point that decision making at any given time, there are millions of events happening for any given, you're making decisions at every second. And what influences those decisions in large part is your genetic inheritance, but in large part um, is all the things that you're exposed to. So what is it about America? It's individualistic. The rights of the individual are greater right now, pendulum wise, than the rights of the collective. Um, you know, every, everybody has a grievance. Um, it's the culture of uh, if I work hard, I can get anything I want. 
so we live in a materialistic society where there is a lot of money to be made from advertising. Um, social media and internet has exacerbated that problem. It's exacerbated it in younger people. Um, it's not that Europe doesn't have social media, but Europe historically has had a greater emphasis on collectivity rather than individual rights. Um, they also have just a culture of smaller environmental footprints as the norm. So, and the other thing is, America is just so big space-wise that part of the reason our carbon footprints are so big is simply the distances that we travel. And we tend to travel with fossil fuels. So there are many reasons for it. Um, I don't know them all, I'm not a sociologist, but those are some of them. And I think one of the biggest ones is this idea that they have constrained space, they have dense populations, and they have a little bit more uniformity of culture and a little bit more collectivism. Okay, I'm going to ask one more, and then we're going to see if the audience has any questions in the little bit of time that we have. But this is this may be sort of a warped way of thinking about it, but because Louisiana has so many disasters and so many obvious impacts from climate change, is that somewhat helpful to shifting the brain's focus? I mean, does that give us a leg up in terms of being willing to adapt or something in our brain being triggered by that? Yeah, so while well, I said that in general, positive works better than negative, fear is a motivator. And um, when you look at what gives people pro-environmental behaviors, there's a few very interesting studies. One is the loss of a favored outdoor space. So many people that end up as environmentalists, that, and they say why, it's because during childhood, some favorite place that they had was ruined. It was flattened for housing development or something like that. That's one cause. Another is having experienced an extreme weather event um, that is attributed to climate change, whether it's wildfires, hurricanes, floods. Those people uh, sometimes are paralyzed by PTSD be, uh, associated with that. But if you're a politician and you are right in the thick of it, it's pretty hard to ignore it. The problem that politicians have in a place like this, I drove from the airport last night to the hotel and you know we went by that big Exxon thing and I asked the cabbie. Um, you got a cab? I got a cab. <laughs> I like cabs because I think they're regulated. We can talk about that. And I, I think cabbies work hard. Um, anyway, I asked him, I said, uh, what is that over there? He told me, I thought it was, but, and I said, um, I bet that provides a lot of fuel for your economy. He said, yeah, everybody, you know, works there or whatever. And I said, do, do people around here, like, are they worried about climate change? And he said, nope, not around here. I found that interesting. Um, not interesting. I mean, it's surpri not surprising, right? Um, and so I do think that being responsible for a public that is concerned about this will influence politicians, but what else is influencing them? We know it's campaign contributions and economic support from people who are very invested in keeping things the way they are. Um, because they, like us, we all struggle from long-term thinking. We get our rewards in the short term. And many people have been very rewarded by fossil fuels, which have revolutionized our world. None of the medical advances that I take advantage of in my practice could have happened without fossil fuels. It's not like fossil fuels were known to be evil when we started. It's like, as I say this in the book, it's like you invent, somebody comes up with some drug that is fabulous and really effective for some terrible disease but you don't find out that it has some really bad side effect till years later. And to make the analogy further, the side effect doesn't happen to you, it happens to somebody else. That's what climate change is like. And so if I developed that drug and I make my money off that drug, the fact the side effect is happening to somebody else someplace else, or at least that's my perception, it doesn't get into my thought process and my decision making and my reward system. My reward system is seeing the positives. And that's why we're having trouble with this transition. One of the reasons. So if you're a politician, that's part of, yes, it's gonna help, but positive will work better than negative as a general rule. I think maybe we have time for like one question from the audience if anybody has anything they wanna ask. Sure. I wanted to talk so much about the dichotomy of the healthcare industry. <laughs> 
Hi, thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, I, I wanted to dig dig in on on two of the things you said, and you said it a couple of times. It's this um, the 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 conflict or the paradox that we are afraid of losing things, right? As humans, that fear or fear of loss can be a motivator um, to to do something or not do something. Coupled with and because of that the positive messaging is stronger. And as you pointed out in one of your slides, the new way is less comfortable. Like we actually are going to have to make sacrifices. And because positive messaging is powerful, we often don't talk about what those sacrifices are. We, we, we do focus on the positive. And yet the reality is you're going to have to sacrifice live in a smaller house, be cold in December, biking, not have stuff, have more uncertainty for your child's future, whatever it is. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about, is there a way to include sacrifice in this conversation and what might be the good or bad ways in terms of our, our brains of talking about that? That is such a great question, and nobody ever asked that. Thank you. That's great. This idea of sacrifice, we, we tend to, um, it's almost like it's a, an obsolete word, like we're not supposed to bring it up, like sacrifice. The truth is we are going to have to. I think the context we have to sacrifice the most in, in the U.S., is we have to help other countries that are going to struggle more. We have to do without certain economic growth factors and take some of our money and help other countries that have nothing. So the whole loss and damages fund, like we've got to step up and do that. We've got the money to do it. It doesn't, now here's the political problem. If you live in Louisiana and you're poor and we're giving money to Bangladesh or you know Africa, it's like, why are you giving the money to them when I'm suffering? So I think the dance we have to do is to try to, it's very tricky. Um, we have to let people recognize the advantages of simpler living. You don't, do you ever want to take care of a house that big? Like, you don't need it. Like, when you get to my stage, you want less. And we have to make having less, that's what Europe can do better. Like, they don't, I mean, it's not like there aren't rich people that have huge houses in Europe, but a lot of people live in a lot less square footage than we do. But, but if we're going to develop, say, housing in the U.S. that's more cost effective, we have a housing crisis, right? Can we make it so it's beautiful too? Can it be small and beautiful and, and you know, village setting with green space? Like, can we make it so that it's attractive? And can we sell that, what we call sacrifice, but it's actually a little bit of contraction of ridiculous expenditure of resources so that we have a little more left over to, to contribute to people in the rest of the world? This is a global problem and we have to do our part, but it's tricky to sell that. So what I would say is, you can frame it as sacrifice because that's really what it is in some ways, except that there are advantages to living smaller and simpler, um, to using your feet instead of a uh, gas-guzzling automobile, to riding bikes and so forth. This is where planning comes in because if you folks can get the formula where living simpler and smaller impact-wise is also rewarding, then it'll feel less like a sacrifice. I do think we have to get away from some of the excessive consumption. This is, sounds like an advertisement, but there's a new movie coming out. It's being screened in the next couple of weeks from Patagonia Films that I am in that is, is called, don't, don't, I hope I don't offend anybody, but this is the name of it. I didn't pick the name. The shit tropocene, like Anthropocene, only the first syllable is that four letter word. And it's about consumption. And it's about how people can get obsessed with consumption and it doesn't make you feel good. It's like an addiction. So there are a lot of things we can sacrifice that are not really sacrifice. They're actually better aligned with what the brain finds rewarding and more aligned with long-term life satisfaction. So maybe that's the answer. I, I wish we could spend another hour with Dr. Duhame, but we unfortunately have to wrap it up. So just uh, please give her a round of applause and thank her for her time.
and I want to jump in quickly to say that Dr. Duhame is going to be doing a quick book signing, um, and so I want to invite uh, her and Melinda to go ahead and um, head off the stage so she can get there. Um, if you might be able to squeeze in a couple more questions to Dr. Duhame uh, if you visit the, the little book nook over there, but let's give them one more round of applause and thanks to Dr. Duhame and Melinda. I do have a couple of announcements if you don't mind sitting tight for just a minute. Um, I, I'm so grateful for this conversation. It's given us so much to think about, especially as planners and designers who want to meet people where they are. I think this helps us think about some of, some more ways that we can meet people where they are. Um, I do want to thank again our session sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, and all of our sponsors. Um, and then after our break, excuse me, please return to this um, this theater, if you want to uh, be a part of Living on the Edge, aligning policy and practice with the realities of housing. And in the workshop theater, we will have the Louisiana Climate Action Plan, what's in it for locals. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, we have Dr. Duhame signing books at the Summit Book Corner. And I think that's it. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>